From the University of Alaska Anchorage, this is Seawolf Voices, a podcast about the pathways to and from education. I'm your host, Matt Jarden. It can be easy to lose yourself in Metro Manila, the capital region of the Philippines with a population of about 14 million people. It can be harder to do that, however, in Utkiavik, Alaska's northernmost city with a population of about 4,000. But EJR David found himself exactly that, lost, struggling with issues of identity after moving from Metro Manila to Utkiavik as a teenager. That is, until he discovered a science at UAA that helped him make sense of what he was feeling. Today, EJ passes on what he's learned as a professor of psychology at his alma mater, as well as a published author, radio host, and advocate. In this episode, EJ talks about the culture shock he experienced after moving to Alaska from the Philippines, the importance of studying psychology from immigrant and indigenous perspectives, and how we can pass on our heritages to future generations. EJ, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, it's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So as you know, you know, anytime two Filipino people are talking together uh, yeah. for the first time, like they have to ask, like, oh, where are you from and everything? So, right. you know, not to sound cliche, but like <laughs> <laughs> what part of the Philippines are your folks from? Well, my parents are both from Pampanga. Mm-hmm. So um, Kapampanga, my, especially my father. My father grew up there. My mom's ancestors were from there, but she grew up in Metro Manila. And that's where I grew up too, Metro Manila. Um, my father was the first person to come here. Mm-hmm. And when I was 14... I followed him to mm-hmm. Alaska and I went to, uh, I didn't just go to Alaska, like Anchorage, Alaska. I right. went to Alaska, Alaska. Mm-hmm. I went to Utkiagavik, used to be known as Barrow. And that's where I went as a 14 year old. I went to eighth grade there, went through high school there. And I consider Utkiagavik to be my, my Alaskan home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I still very, I'm still very much connected to that place to this day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So what was that adjustment like from Metro Manila yeah. to Utkiavik? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting. You know, when, when I tell people that the first contrast that they think of is obviously the climate, right? Mm-hmm. Very different. Mm-hmm. I came from a tropical country mm-hmm. of over 7,000 islands yeah. to by, you know, this, this place by the Arctic ocean. Mm-hmm. Um, but really to me as a 14 year old, I didn't care too much about that. Mm-hmm. You know, like I don't know many 14 year olds who, who care about weather right, <laughs> or right. climate. Um, to me, the biggest change was coming from a city of mm-hmm. millions of min- millions and millions and mil- millions of people, you mm-hmm. know, crowded every day coming from that mm-hmm. to a very rural place, mm-hmm. you know, a, a small town of about 4,000 people. And the only way in and out is by airplane. Um, so to me, that was the biggest change, but, but other, oh, of course, culturally, you know, that, that really is, you know, to me, that's the most significant and most impactful contrast for me. Other than that, I, I, I loved my time in Barrow. It was a very, uh, important part of my life. I struggled a lot, but I learned a lot and, you know, I owe a lot, uh, to the, to the Nupia community. That's awesome. My mm-hmm. sister was, uh. So she was born there in Cebu, and when she came here, okay. she was about, you know, a little younger than you were, about 12, mm. but we didn't go anywhere like Utkiavik. We went to Juno. Juno, okay. And, you know, so there was still, you know, more people yeah. than Utkiavik, but, uh, man, you know, she <laughs> just did not take to that. And I, I, I'm, I'm only, I'm hearing this secondhand, because I was born here. You were born right? in, were you born in Juno? I was born in Juno. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so I only have, like, the stories of what it okay. was like for her to transition but uh yeah she just did not take to that and she doesn't live here anymore all right so. what about you did you like juno i did it was just small you know okay. so it was okay. great like mm-hmm. I, I was there up until senior year of high school right? okay and then i moved here okay so while i was living there like i had gone to the philippines uh several times like for okay. vacation and stuff and to like meet the family and stuff yeah. but Juno is beautiful, though. Yeah, it yeah. is beautiful. And I named yeah. my son after Juno. So um, Your son's name is Juno? My son's name is Juno. Like spelled like Juno? Exactly spelled oh, wow. like Juno. Yeah. See, there you go. Yeah. That's that's, uh, that's an homage to, yeah. your, to your hometown there. Yeah. So that's one awesome. day we'll have to take him. So, and yeah. you know, I'm sure you know about this, but very long Filipino history in Juno. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And huge Filipino community in Juno, too. Yeah. yeah. So. My dad was uh, really big into the uh, Filipino community while we were down there. Nice. So, yeah. And nice. I remember, like, when they opened, um, oh, I forgot what it's called, but it's like the Filipino Square that they have. Okay. There. Yeah. Like, in the, uh, downtown. Yeah. Downtown. downtown Juno, right yeah. outside of the uh, the, the Red yeah. Dog, I believe there's it is. A, yeah. So, there's a Jose Rizal uh, 
I guess, statue or yeah. a bust, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, we were living down there, like, when that whole thing opened. And then uh-huh. there was a big ceremony. And yep. my younger brother, like, he did the uh, the tinikling. And oh, uh, nice. yeah. I forget what the dance is, but it's there's, there's a dance that's on the benches oh, yeah. that they're doing. Yeah. And I yeah. can't remember what that one's called. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't know how people had the coordination <laughs> to, like, dance on the bench. On and the benches, like, yeah. And, yeah. and, and they stack them up, too. Through. They st- stack up the benches, too. So yeah. they go higher and higher. Yeah. yeah yep. It's bananas. Yeah. So. I mean, it's scales. All, all, all Filipino traditional dances, like mm-hmm. the tinikling and the, the bunko dance, the bench dance. Yeah. And there's one where um, they hold um, candles on their hands. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, and then yes. there's one where they put, they, they have, like, pots, clay pots on their heads. Mm-hmm. A lot of Filipino traditional dances... Are, are pretty acrobatic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I missed out on those jeans. So my brother had all of that. So you got to be pretty athletic to, yeah. to do many of them. Yeah, yeah. I did do, I, it was the uh, the rigodon uh, when we lived, yeah, when we moved up here. Like, you know, my dad, first thing he does is, all right, I got to find the Filipino community. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh, nice, and yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, we did that. And then, uh, you know, they started a, a cultural dance mm-hmm. uh, troupe. And the rigodon was like one of the only ones that, uh, that I could did. do, you know, that didn't require any uh, acrobatics. <laughs> from me i'm like okay i could i could do that so it's, well i'm glad you're doing it hopefully your son ends up you know doing some some filipino dancing yeah too. I, I, and i want to get into that but like uh <laughs> but yeah like ever since my parents like retired yeah because like my dad was my in and then i just somehow like lost you know connection mm-hmm. to it. but uh yeah i want to mm-hmm. i want to talk a little bit about uh, more about that okay uh, later, sure later. sure sure um, so what, uh, inspired you to pursue psychology as both like a major oh, uh, and, uh, and a career? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. To be honest with you, I had no idea what psychology was growing up. And, um, it wasn't until I got to UAA when I even found out what psychology was. You know, mm-hmm. I, I know this may be funny for some people to hear because now we have people taking psychology like in high school, mm-hmm. you know, but I really had no idea what psychology was and, when I got to UAA, um, I was a fine arts major, you know, because mm-hmm. I was I was pretty good at like drawing and mm-hmm. you know painting and all of that stuff, and so I, I I started as a fine arts major, and I had to take an intro to psych class mm-hmm. as part of my general education requirement, and so you know I enrolled to one and I attended it just because I had to, but that was the first time I learned that there's such a thing as a science of human thought emotions and behavior and you know and I was never like into school really and so Mm -hmm. I wanted to stay away from anything science Mm -hmm. you know but then when I got to UAA and I attended my psychology course there you know and and found out that there's this science right for understanding the way I felt Mm -hmm. and the way I behaved and the way I thought Um, and also you know understanding the the behaviors and the the feelings and attitudes of the people that I loved, mm-hmm. then that hooked me, you know, mm-hmm. because because prior to that point, you know, going through uh, my my move from the Philippines to Utkagavik and going through my formative years in Utkagavik, being exposed to all of these different, you know, cultures and and you know having plenty of you know amazing but also painful experiences. Uh, during my middle school and high school years, I had a lot of questions about myself. Like, why, why did I think the you know the, the things that I thought of, you know, or why did I feel this way, especially about my culture, about you know my heritage language? Um, why did I have this attitude, you know, towards other Filipinos, mm-hmm. and why did I behave this way toward them? So I had those questions about myself, you know, like. Why did my parents or my my community teach me to be this way? You know, why did they value, for instance, uh, the American way of living? Why did everybody I know in the Philippines wanted to leave the Philippines? You know, those questions, you know, were beginning to really bug me. And when I got to UAA and I found out that there's a, a science to providing, you know, potentially providing answers to those questions. Mm-hmm you know, then I was hooked. And that's what led me to psychology. So it was really more about me. So people talk about research. To, to me, it was like me search. <laughs> I, I, you know, it was it was me trying to better understand myself and my loved ones better. So how did your parents take it when you first enrolled, <laughs> uh, wanting to be a fine arts <laughs> major? But, but, uh, but, you know, I know yeah. that you're a doctor now, yeah. but was there any pushback from your family when you told them <clears throat> that you didn't want to become, you know, that kind of doctor <laughs> that or kind of doctor. a lawyer, <laughs> engineer, basically any of the acceptable yeah. career fields for a, yeah. you know, a second generation immigrant sure, kid? Sure, sure. 
Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I, I understand, you know, where that question is coming from because a lot of Filipinos really do want their, you know, their 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 children, right, or the younger generation to pursue um, these careers, like becoming mm-hmm. a lawyer, becoming like quote unquote a real doctor, right, or or especially nurses, right. Just just go into, you know, go into a, a field that you know is practical, right, a field that will almost guarantee you a good career, like a good paying career, right? Which is understandable, right? They they want the best for us. But fortunately, or maybe unfortunately <laughs> for me, I don't know. Um, I, I never really had that much pressure from my parents. I um, Like I said, I, I, I grew up in Utkiagavik with my father and uh, my mom stayed in the Philippines. So my mom really had, you know, no like big say in terms mm-hmm. of what my life was like anymore mm-hmm. i mean you know don't, don't don't get me wrong like my mom is super impactful uh, in my life but at that <laughs> point like she just you know wanted me to you know make a living and, and whatever you know she, she wasn't pressuring me to go into any direction and then you know and I, I did not have a you know the best relationship with my father um and so even while i was still in high school i was pretty much on my own already my last two years in high school, I was pretty much uh, living independently, you know, just living with friends. And, uh, you know, I didn't realize it then, but I guess I technically met the definition of being a homeless person because I, I, I had no home. I was sleeping in friends' couches and floors and, and you know, and all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, that's why I'm, you know, I'm very thankful. Um, to Utkiagovic, um, mm-hmm. to, to many families and many people in Utkiagovic because they took care of me. Now that I look back on it, you know, um, giving me rides, giving me a floor to sleep in, <laughs> you know, a couch to sleep in, especially in Utkiagovic, can get very, very cold. You know, it, it was, was, was life-saving and, and you know, life-changing. Um, but anyways, so to answer your question, no, I, I pretty much, you know, was, was, was on my own and you know, my parents were just thankful that uh, I was going to school and that, you know, I was going to get some kind of job. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't think it was in their expectation or dreams, you know, that, that I would be where I am now. It, definitely not in mine. Um, you know, again, for my family, because, you know, we were starting so low, you know, I guess the expectation was just for me to get a good job somehow, um, a job that will be enough to support me and help out with the family. You know, so we didn't have those high, lofty goals like many Filipino families might have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do they say when you got the PhD? <laughs> well, well, you know, th- th- of course they're very proud of me, yeah. very supportive of me. Um, you know, when I when I first got my bachelor's degree from UAA, mm-hmm. you know, that that was all already great. And you know, I, of course, I had to like explain to them. A little bit what psychology is mm-hmm. and what kind of jobs I can get with a psychology degree, yeah. uh, but then when I when I I realized pretty early on when I became a psych major that I wanted to go into grad school, mm-hmm. um, either to get my master's degree or get my PhD, and so when I when I made that decision that you know that my bachelor's degree wasn't going to be enough, mm-hmm. um, I um, I had to speed up my process because you know the thing is even though my parents did not have those kinds of career aspirations for me or pressure on me um you know they wanted me to get a job and you know and and start helping out right doesn't matter what kind of job it is but just start helping out and so when i realized that i was i I wanted to go get either my master's degree or my phd afterwards Mm -hmm. i knew that i was obviously going to add more years to my education and so i had to speed up my bachelor's and so i actually graduated in three years from uaa yeah i was i was taking i was taking crazy number of credits man i was like 18 credits per semester was low for me Mm -hmm. yeah um you know most of the time i was taking like 21 24 credits you know several times i had to like petition uh, to, so that I could be allowed to take 24 credits because that's not allowed, taking summer credits just so I can get done in three years because mm-hmm. I knew that I was going to have more years afterwards. And so when I when I told my parents that, you know, that I was going to pursue it some more, of course, they're supportive, but, you know, they, they, were not, they were not able to support me in any way, like financially. Mm-hmm. There's no college fund for me. There was nothing like that. And so I had to, I had to hustle 
um, yeah, and really support all of my education. And, and luckily enough, you know, I was I was able to get some scholarships and, and all of that. Uh, did you move to Anchorage at that time, or was UAA the reason you moved to Anchorage, or yeah. were you able to take distance from Utkavik? Because I was not even <laughs> expecting to go to college, man. I was, you know, after my junior year of high school, I was like, dude, I have like one year left of high school, and then I, I don't know what I'm going to do after that, right? And so I actually enlisted in the Army. <laughs> I was like, because I have no other options so i enlisted in the army everything was said i you know they flew me down to anchorage for all my physical tests and all of that stuff and then i signed all the paperwork i knew exactly where i was going to go for basic training i knew where i was going to go after basic training i knew what my job was going to be in the army they were just waiting for me to graduate from high school Mm -hmm. right but then like halfway through my senior year there was this program and it's still around although it's not you know the same form anymore it's the um ua scholars program where the top, at least back then, it was like the top 10% of every graduating high school class in Mm -hmm. the state of Alaska gets like a tuition waiver to go to any UA uh, campus, right? And, you know, I was going to school in Barrow High School. I think we have like maybe 40 people in my graduating (laughs) class. And I just happened to be right at that top 10%, you know? And, And I, you know, so halfway through my senior year, I found out that I qualified by accident uh, for this uh, really full ride (laughs) to go to any University of Alaska school that I chose. Really, that's when I realized that, shoot, you know, here's here's an opportunity. Like, I wasn't even planning to go to college, right? I was going to go to the military. And now I had this great opportunity to go to college. And that so that's when I really like, okay, I'm going to really take school seriously now. So I decided to go to UAA just because I I knew people here that I could live with. Again, no money, <laughs> nothing, right? But but I knew people here that I could live with um, and you know and they they were nice enough to allow me to live with them for free. You know, so my housing was free, my tuition was free because of this UA scholars uh, program. Yeah, and then so I just applied for a few other scholarships here and there so that I could buy books. I got a job on the side. Um, I worked for Hope Community Resources was one of my many jobs. But yeah, it was, you know, and, and I just hustled, man. I, I uh, my, my daily schedule when I was a college student was wake up, wake up at 4.30 a.m., get to work at 5 a.m., work from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m., and then drive to campus to take classes from 9 a.m. to like 3 p.m., and then from 3 p.m., to set like 8 p.m., go back to work to complete my eight hours. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then go home at around like 9 p.m., then do it again the following day. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so that's, 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 you know, that's, that's how I made it work. <laughs> <laughs> Did things get easier when you left to pursue your master's and uh, doctorate? Yeah. And so, around that time, you know, when I decided that I'm going to go beyond my bachelor's degree, right, mm-hmm. in psychology, uh, UAA was not a doctoral granting institution at that time. There was no PhD program in psychology or in any program at UAA at that time. We had a master's program in psychology. And so that was kind of like my, I guess, my backup. Like if I, you know, because I wanted to get my PhD, right? So Mm -hmm. I was applying to PhD programs. But in my mind, like if I, you know, if all these PhD programs reject me, you know, at least I know that I can stay here at UAA and get my master's at least, right? So, so yeah, so that was nice. Um, Did it get easier? (laughs) Uh, Well, I'd say, again, I got lucky again in that uh, one of the PhD programs that I applied to accepted me, one, (laughs) you know, like they they, they saw something in me and and they they accepted me into their program. But they also offered me, you know, a pretty uh, generous like financial aid uh, package that allowed me to get my master's and PhD from their program and I went to the University of Illinois in Champaign mm-hmm. you know I was pretty much able to to do that uh, with no cost to me because of the the scholarships and the fellowships that they provided um, are there any uh, lessons or experiences from your time at UAA that still uh, that you still drop on <laughs> plenty you know earlier I said I, I owe the community of Utkiagavik a lot for you know, giving me rides and giving me a floor to sleep on. You know, I can say the same thing about UAA. I owe UAA a lot. Well, I owe 
the University of Alaska system a lot because they had that program that that allowed me to to go to school here for free. But UAA especially, uh, because when I arrived on campus as a kid from Utkiagavik, from Barrow High School, I mean, there are more UAA students than there are people in Utkiagavik. You know what I mean? That was a big change for me, you know, like having to navigate, you know, the campus and understanding all of the different requirements, you know, the GERs and the everything that's in it, you know, mm -hmm. like all the different kinds of requirements that are in the GERs. And so, you know, UAA provided me with, with amazing support. So I was also in the honors program. <laughs> Back then it was just the honors program. Now it's the honors college. You know, mm -hmm. so it's grown a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but back then I was in the honors program, again, by accident, because I automatically got into it because I was a UA scholar. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so, but the U, yeah, the, the honors program back then, Ron Spatz, um, who started that program, they helped me out a lot, man, navigating, you know, all the requirements, really making sure that I take classes that count. You know, and not only classes that count, but classes that meets multiple requirements. You know, and that's how I was able to do my degree so efficiently, you know, and get it done in three years. So, yeah, so not only did I get, like, the financial support from UAA, you know, I got, like, moral support. I got, you know, I got all of that. And and, and, and it was great, man. It was great. Um, it's It's really, you know, now that I'm, this this interview right here is making me think back to all of this. <laughs> I really appreciate it. But I was um, when I grad because I graduated in three years. Me and a couple of other students have the distinction of who graduated with me. Mm -hmm. um, we have the distinction of being the first ever graduate of the of the honors program and the UA Scholars program. Um, because again, that that was just getting started at that point. So now, yeah, so now that I'm, I'm thinking about it, yeah, I'm like, back then it wasn't a big deal when they told me that, like, mm -hmm. hey, yeah, you're the first graduate of the honors program, or you're the first graduate of the UA scholars program. It, it didn't seem like a big deal to me, but now, you know, 20 years later, oh man, yeah, 20 years later, you know, and like I said, the, the honors program is now an honors college, it's grown, mm -hmm. and, you know, the UA scholars program is still around in some way to this day. It's an honor for me, you know, to be to be that. <laughs> Especially because of everything I just told you. Like I, yeah. all of this was unexpected. I feel like Forrest Gump, dude. Right. <laughs> I feel like I just end up in the right place at the right time. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna have a "this is your life" moment. <laughs> <laughs> just looking back, let's reminisce. Yeah. <laughs> what led you to return to UAA as a psychology professor? Well, UAA, you know, Alaska. I've always considered Alaska my home. You know, I didn't even want to leave Alaska to begin with. You know, it's just that. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there's there was no PhD program in Alaska uh, around the time I was getting ready to to look for one, right? Mm -hmm. So I had no choice but to leave Alaska. But you know, Alaska's home. This is where my family is. Um, and so when I was in Illinois, and maybe I was about a year away from from getting my PhD in Illinois, the psychology department here they were starting this PhD program in clinical community psychology with a cultural and indigenous and rural emphasis. And uh, again, luckily enough, they still remembered me <laughs> from when I was an undergrad here and knew that I was, you know, getting my PhD in Illinois, focusing on clinical community psychology and that my research is on, you know, indigenous, you know, cultural psychology. And so they reached out to me. And said, "Hey, you know, do you want to apply to this new program that we're starting?" And so I said, "Okay, of course, you know that that's home." Um, and so I applied, and again, luckily, they still like me, and <laughs> um, they hired me. You know, this was back in 2007, right? So now it's been 15 years. I, um, you know, I've been very lucky to be able to to work um, with the psychology department, with the PhD programs, more specifically, but. You know, but perhaps just as importantly, I, I love being home. You know, this is home. Um, this is where my family is, my friends. So, so yeah, that's uh, so everything just aligned for me. So it seems like a lot of your research and a lot of your course offerings are, you know, focusing on psychology, but 
with an emphasis on, Mm -hmm. you know, the immigrants experience or Mm -hmm. the indigenous experience. Yeah. What are some important things to know for new students who are just now, you know, starting to dive into that subject or explore those parts of their identity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when, when I, like I, you know, the, the, the story I was sharing with you earlier, like what got me hooked into psychology, um, psychology really began to provide me with some answers to the questions I had about myself and my community, right? Um, but it was not enough, you know. So even though I was excited about psychology um, because of those things, I realized pretty early on too that um, the majority of psychology was conducted, you know, by Western people um, with Western participants with Western theories, you know, and and their work and their methods were being um, really uh, guided by Western worldviews, and so. Even though I was getting some answers to my questions, I also felt that the answers were still very limited. Um, there was very few research conducted specifically on, well, first of all, there, there was still very few research conducted on uh, racial and ethnic minorities um, back then, at least <laughs> 25 years ago. <laughs> um, and especially, you know, research on Filipino Americans and the experiences of Filipino Americans. And so I, you know, so there was a huge gap and I thought, well, you know, that's, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's, uh, that's an area that I can contribute in. Um, and so, yeah, so over the years, that's, that's what I've been doing on, uh, doing my work on. And so what can I tell students about it? Well, even though it's gotten better, um, over the past 25 years, there's been a lot of growth, uh, when it comes to ethnic minority psychology, even Asian American psychology, and more specifically with Filipino American psychology, we've we've grown a lot over the past twenty five years. Nevertheless, there's still a lot of questions that are left to be answered. Um, you know, the Filipino community, for example, even though you know I'm all for you know unity, I'm all for you know collective action. The Filipino community is very diverse. Like, you know, we were just talking at the beginning of this podcast where our parents are from. Mine is from Pampanga, but I grew up in the Tagalog region, right? Yours is from Cebu, right? In the Visayas region. But, you know, we, we there's a lot of different cultural and ethnic groups in the Philippines. You know what I mean? And and we have, you know, different languages, different cultures, different traditions, many times different beliefs, right? Different, mm-hmm. <laughs> different um worldviews even uh, different values right and and we those are very important to understand right so that's just one you know uh, i guess dimension of diversity you know within the filipino community that can impact our psychological experiences so you know so there's still a lot that that can be done in this area mm-hmm. yeah and so that that's one thing that i can tell students and then the other one i guess more generally you know is we cannot take culture out of the equation right culture and history especially those of us those communities with with the history of colonialism right so Mm -hmm. that's why the program that that i teach and we have an indigenous psychology emphasis right we live right here especially us here in alaska we live really we live in an indigenous place right this is uh this is a place where you know different indigenous peoples have been living in for many 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 generations right and I feel as as Filipinos especially because you know Filipinos are the largest immigrant group in the state of Alaska we need to understand that as a community we need to understand that you know that the the land now that we call home right and that we live in these are indigenous lands and the history of indigenous peoples here in these lands you know is painful right and they still are experiencing colonialism and you know active you know erasure of their cultures and so then as immigrant people you know we we need to make sure that we do not become complicit uh to that you know so to me then when i work with students i want especially non-native students whether they be filipino or white or whatever else if they're non-native you know i want them to understand that we know we need to to work with in collaboration with you know the native communities of, of these lands now you know, to make sure that, you know, oppression doesn't happen here anymore. You know, oppression has been happening for, for, for many generations now, you know. And so us, you know, we have a decision to make, right? Do we want to, 
to be complicit in the continued cycle of oppression or do we want to be on the other side to be you know to, to be on the side of you know stopping oppression um, and you know the work that I do in psychology with my students I hope can at least you know address oppression in some little way mm-hmm. what do you most want students to take away from your class yeah well in addition to what I just said you know to, to be to be a little bit more critical you know about how we do our work you know and who we work with mm-hmm. right you know it, it's to me it's I want them to to understand that psychology is not just an academic or scholarly endeavor right it's not just something that you do in the classroom it's not just something that you do in the laboratory Um, it's not just something that you do in the clinic Mm -hmm. i want my students to apply psychology to address oppression i want them to apply psychology you know to promote social justice you know i want them to take psychology out of our classrooms and our clinics and our hospitals and our laboratories and actually use them to benefit different communities, especially communities that have been um, marginalized and oppressed and forgotten for a very long time. How important is it for, like if you get a student who Mm -hmm. has a similar background as you, you know, who Mm -hmm. comes from an immigrant background, Mm -hmm. how important is it that, you know, they see you and know, Oh, that yeah. you know exactly what that they've been through. Or, mm-hmm. you know, you have an indigenous student who mm-hmm. came from the rural areas like Utkavik, and mm-hmm. they, you know, see you and they know exactly that mm-hmm. you know or have taken the time to understand what mm-hmm. they're going through. Like how mm-hmm. important is that that they're seeing that in the people that are teaching them? I think it's I I hope. <laughs> I, I hope, you know, I hope they, they see that uh as a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um because I remember, you know, based on my own experience as as good of an experience um, I as I had with UAA, I did not have a Filipino professor at UAA. It wasn't until I got to, you know, my doctoral studies at the University of Illinois when I finally had my first Filipino professor ever. You know, and so to me, you know, I hope that when, you know, like I said earlier, sometimes I teach undergraduate classes also like I just taught intro to psychology last semester I and and I had many students there from from <laughs> you know students who are immigrants even Filipino students you know and and I hope that you know when they saw me perhaps for many of them you know they were just beginning college they were freshmen mm, that might be their first class and for them it was like hey my very first professor <laughs> in college is Filipino just like me you know I, I hope that um you know, that uh, at least, in the very least, I hope it's, it reminds them that they belong here, right? That people like us, you know, belong in this space. And that our, not just our presence, mm-hmm. but our perspectives, right? As different as our perspectives may, may be, you know, with, with, you know, the dominant perspectives. We belong here, right? And, 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 and we are valued here. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the very least, that's what I hope they get from it. So more recently, you've also become a co-host of Hometown Alaska over <laughs> yeah. in Alaska Public Media yeah. uh, alongside uh, Kathleen McCoy, who mm-hmm. used to be here at UAA mm-hmm. Advancement. Mm-hmm. Um, so what led you to that position? Kathleen, actually. Um, <laughs> so Kathleen um, interviewed me a couple of times over the years and then... Um, as time passed by and as uh, hometown Alaska um, evolved over the years, they started looking for, you know, other people to co-host. And Kathleen, uh, I'm glad she remembered me and uh, recommended me to the Alaska public media, I guess, decision makers. <laughs> <laughs> and they uh, they reached out to me and they asked me if I would like to do it. And yeah, you know, and after meeting with them and, and learning more about you know the the expectations and responsibilities um you know i said yeah let's do it um you know and it's 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 not it's a side gig obviously (laughs) um you know uaa and and being a professor here um is still you know my priority but you know having that platform at uh, alaska public media to be able to reach many people um not just throughout the state of alaska but really 
throughout the world now because it's recorded and people can log on to the internet and listen to it you know at any time to have that platform was was really the the deciding factor for me you know because then it allows me to to talk about topics or discuss topics um that you know that i feel are important you know and 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 reach people who you know may otherwise not think about those topics at all so that's what got me to agree to do it so you've written four psychology books uh, brown skin uh, white minds internalized depression the psychology of oppression mm. and we have not stopped trembling yet yep. um so that most recent one we have not stopped trembling yet that differs from your other books in that yep. it is more personal and mm-hmm. it tells your story cut to a few years later and now you help tell the stories of our neighbors and our community do you consider that expansion into personal storytelling as sort of a continuation of your work in psychology uh, yes, I think so. First of all, thank you for for mentioning all those books. But but as you can tell just from the titles, right? All of those books sound very depressing. Uh, they're about very dark topics, and, and they are. They are, and also very personal to me. Um, you know, all of those books, like I said earlier, my work really, my research really is me search, right? That's how I got started in psychology. So right from the get go, it was. It's always been personal to me. However, now that I'm at my, you know, at the point in my life, in my career, where, you know, I have developed some wisdom, <laughs> I'd like to think. Um, but also, you know, I'm, I'm in a privileged place, right? Um, I have tenure, you know, I'm, I'm a full professor. So, you know, I, I, I'm in a very privileged space. And so I think now I can really be completely honest uh, with how I think um, psychology should be done. Um, because even though the science part of psychology is great, like I said, you know, that's one of the things that got me attracted to it. We cannot ignore the reality that people are not robots and that, uh, you know, we have values, we have feelings, um, we have subjective experiences. And so we cannot just approach our work, especially the field of psychology, in a, in a purely objective way. You know, we have to acknowledge the reality that, that the human experience is complex and messy. And as awesome as our studies are in the lab, where we can control for variables <laughs> and, you know, and, and have it super clean, the reality is that life in the human experience is not clean at all. It's messy, you know. Uh, the reality is messy, um, and part of that messiness actually is not a bad thing. So that's the that's the thing that I'm I'm beginning to understand now and value a little bit more. Um, in that, for the longest time, I was trained to consider these other variables as mess, as confounding variables, right? Using scientific terms. These are confounding variables that weakens your, you know, your your conclusions, right, or the the conclusions that you can make from your findings. Well, although that might be true to some extent, when it comes to the human experience, those confounding variables, that mess, it completes it, and it's not a bad thing that we need to control for, or eliminate, or get rid of, right? It's something that we need to incorporate. Right and acknowledge as a valuable part of the human experience, and so yeah. So my personal experiences, my own hurts, my own pains, and my community's pains, those are not things that we should control for or eliminate. You know, those are things that we need to incorporate in our experiences because because it's a significant part of of who we are now. Right, it's impacted us for many generations. It's an extension, so that you know. So me. I'm putting in myself now in addition to these numbers. So I, you know, if you, if you like, we have not stopped trembling yet, right? The most recent work that I, that my, my most recent book, it's really written as letters to my children and to my wife. And yeah, sure. I, I have like numbers in there. I have statistics in there, right? Um, just like we do in typical, you know, psychology writings. But I also share stories. So I put meat into those numbers, Right. So if you can if you think of the numbers as the bones, my 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 personal experiences are the meat. Right. Because and, and it completes it more. 
You know what I mean? Uh, it's a it's a it's a more complete picture. Um, and so yeah, so that's you know it, it is an extension, but for me it's 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 always been the reality. You know, and the other thing that I want to say about that too is when 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 I when I look at those numbers, you know, again for for many years now, I look at these studies, I look at statistics, and I teach them to my students, right? To me, those are not just numbers. Those are not just statistics. To me, those numbers have always been very personal. When I look at those numbers, I see myself. When I look at those depression rates, when I look at suicide ideation rates, when I look at violence against women rates, those are not just numbers to me. In those numbers, I see myself. I see my children. I see my wife. I see my daughters. So it's always been personal. So mm -hmm. sure, it, it is an extension of my work now that I'm, you know, that I'm uh, um, mixing in my my own personal experiences in my work, in my books. But no, that's always been reality too. So building off of that, mm -hmm. um, so you, you mentioned your kids, and mm -hmm. at the top of the episode, we were talking sure. about uh, our kids and passing things on. Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, uh, my wife and I just mm -hmm. had a kid eight mm -hmm. months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so she is part Yupik, and we really want him to grow up close to his Filipino and yeah. his Yupik heritage. Yeah. So do you have any advice for parents, um, you know, like myself, who really want to pass on the, the heritage and the history to mm -hmm. their kids, making sure that the next generation is cognizant of all of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations oh, thank you. to you and your <laughs> wife. Um, but, you know, it's that that's a very good question. And I've, I've been getting that question a lot over the years because... You know, I've, I've been talking about my, my kids are uh, so Filipino and my wife is Koyuko and Athabascan. Um, and so my I've been calling my kids Filibascans <laughs> um, for for at least 13 years now. Um, and so I've been getting that question a lot. Right. Yeah. So how, how do you, you know, get any advice to, you know, to to make sure that our kids are connected to their cultures and. Sure, you know I have many advice. I'm mean, <laughs> probably not good advice, but you know if there's one thing that 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 I want to uh, say, or a couple of things actually, one, we live in a world where that is going to be difficult, right? It's going to be difficult to have our children be connected to their roots. You know, in our case here, in our conversation here, it's connected to their na native roots and connected to their Filipino roots. That's going to be difficult. Not impossible, but it's difficult. Now, that statement right there, I hope when people hear this, I hope that makes people question why. Why is that difficult? And that is because we live in a world, we live in a society that makes it difficult, right? It's very difficult to learn about one's Filipino history. Like a non-whitewashed, truthful, as painful as it might be, Filipino history. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing about Native history. It's going to be very difficult for one to learn about, you know, you know, truthful, accurate, critical, uh, and and oftentimes very painful, right? Native history. We have that battle right now in our country, mm -hmm. right? About what we should be teaching our children. So yeah, it, it's going to be very difficult. We can teach our children the languages. I think we can definitely start small, right? In our own homes, in our household, we can teach them the languages. Um, my wife and I, for example, you know, something as as people will consider it little, but we don't consider it little. We actually think of it as very significant and meaningful. But we, we gave our children Filipino names and uh, Danaka names. So so they know <laughs> right away, right from the get go. And officially, when they see their birth certificate, you know, that they're both Filipino and Athabascan. Right. So mm -hmm. it's right there. So it's built into their lives already. Um, so, you know, so things like that we can we can do. We, we, we try our best, right, to teach our children um, the languages. Um, we participate in, you know, native events and native gatherings just as much as we participate in Filipino gatherings. So with the hope, right, with the hope that, you know, even though the majority of the world outside of our bubble makes it difficult for our children to be connected to their roots, you know, the parts that we can control, right, are a little bit easier. So, so that's what actually, you know, one, one of the examples of that is my, I have a, I have a, you know, my son is turning 10 here in a few days. 
when he was in kindergarten and he was having his first um, school picture day ever. You know, so it was a big deal. He found out mm-hmm. about school picture day it was a big deal. You know, and when when he heard, oh, it's a big deal, he was like, oh, I'm gonna go wear my barong. Oh yeah, right? barong Tagalog, <laughs> right? Yeah, I know. But to him, that was just like an automatic thought. You know, mm-hmm. it's like it's an it's an important event, and when there's an important event, you wear your barong Tagalog. Yeah, you know what I mean. And to me, the the fact that his mind was shaped that way to think that way automatically, you know, to me, that's like that's a big shift from me. You know, and it's, that's just one generation. You know what I mean? Like pe- we talk about, and we are saddened when we think about. Oh, look how much we lose just from one generation to the next, mm-hmm. right? Language, traditions, values. You know, and that's true, right? We are losing a lot from one generation to the next. But we should also see how we can heal pretty quickly too from one generation to the next. And that little experience right there with my son, you know, from just me who was not very proud of my Filipino heritage, you know, at some point going through the American school system when I was younger, you know, so for, from someone like me to now my son to just like be automatically be proud, right? No doubts, you know, no shame, no embarrassment, you know, to just say, yeah, I'm going to go wear my Barong Tagalog <laughs> and rock my Barong Tagalog at school. To me, that's, you know, that's a sign right there that that we can also heal. So yeah, so like little things like that, right? So that's what one one thing that I would say. That's a very long one thing. <laughs> but the other thing that I would say too, especially for, you know, mixed race people, right? So Alaska, we are, you know, when we look at demographics, we have one of the higher percentages of mixed race people um, in, in the entire country. So, you know, so your son is Filipino and Yupik. My children are Filipino and Athabascan, but there are many other, you know, combinations of people um, here in our state. And, you know, what I, what I, what me and my wife tell our kids, you know, and this, this, this pertains uh, especially to, to indigenous uh, people is, you know, my kids with their tribal IDs, it tells them that they're only part Athabascan, right? And I know that's been how many people, including myself, you know, have thought about mixed race people like, oh, you're half this, half that. You're three quarters this or one eighth this and all that. <laughs> so what one advice that 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 I have is to start challenging that that narrative, you know, that, you know, you're part this part that half this half that like my wife and I don't consider our kids half Filipino, half Athabascan. You know, we, we consider them as 100 percent Filipino and 100 percent Athabascan. You know, we don't want them to feel any less Filipino than other Filipinos or any less Athabascan than other Athabascans. Um, mm-hmm. Because we see those two um, roots of theirs as sources of strength, right? And so we want them to fully participate in it, to fully engage in it, and to, to fully benefit from them, mm-hmm. right? To be fully connected, you know, to, to both of them. And so, so yeah, so we don't, we don't see our kids as part whatever, you know, we, they are full, you know, and, and, my wife and I were like, it doesn't really make sense, you know, that that me plus my wife equals half. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it just it's, that's not basic math. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, and so you know, we teach our kids that that they are not part of anything. Um, they are full of everything. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful, yeah. and I never even thought about it, but now yeah. I am super excited to get my kid up wrong when he's older. Uh, oh so. yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you already started answering mm-hmm. uh, this next question, but how do you think we can be better as a community mm-hmm. when it comes to acknowledging our, you know, immigrant and indigenous mm-hmm. uh, histories? Mm-hmm. Well, we should start there. We should acknowledge it, you mm-hmm. know. And I think over the years we've gotten a little bit better, especially, um, you know, acknowledging that you know these lands are indigenous lands. So we, you know, we do a lot of land acknowledgments now. But 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 I do hope that we start moving beyond. You know those those land acknowledgments because there are plenty more perhaps more meaningful things that we need to do um, beyond just you know acknowledging right that this is a, an indigenous place so yeah so we've gotten better there you know but but what are some of those things that we can do that goes beyond uh, just acknowledging it well you know there are actions 
<laughs> like, <laughs> like actions that we can take. You know, we can work with our native communities, right, uh, collaboratively with them because we also need to avoid, you know, the, the, the potential to become like saviors, right? We're not, we're not here to save anybody, right? Where we can be allies, we can be accomplices, you know, we can work collaboratively in partnership uh, with our indigenous um, communities to make sure, right, that these lands are taken care of, right, that all of us are taken care of to make sure that injustice and oppression doesn't happen in these lands. So, you know, so that's one. When it comes to the immigrant communities, you know, again, in addition to acknowledging it, there are a couple of things. One, as I mentioned earlier, as immigrants, we need to make sure that we do not become complicit, right, to the continued erasure of the indigenous peoples of these lands. And I think stronger immigrant indigenous solidarity and partnership and collaboration is what we must do. And UAA, it's, it's a UAA podcast, <laughs> and I think UAA is in a very unique and special position to be able to facilitate that because we live in, we are located on indigenous lands. We are located in Anchorage or the Gayakuk, as the Dena'ina people calls it, right? And we have a large immigrant population, right? So if there's a place, right, that is that is ready and that is ripe for stronger, meaningful immigrant indigenous partnership and collaboration, it's this place. UAA has really the opportunity here to become world leaders world leaders, not just national leaders, but world leaders into doing that mm -hmm. like, and, 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 you know, and, and shaping what that might look like and what the benefits of an immigrant indigenous, you know, partnership can bring to our mm -hmm. state and to the nation and to the world. So that's one. Um, the other thing that I want to say is, you know, when about the immigrants specifically this time, Oftentimes when we think about immigrants, especially when we're trying to convince people to be more open to immigrants <laughs> and to appreciate immigrants more, you know, the arguments that we often fall into are, well, immigrants do the jobs that many people don't want to do. Or, you know, immigrants have this much spending power or they bring this much to our economy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Which are again true, right? Oftentimes those claims are backed up by, you know, some statistics or some research, right? So even though they are factual, I really think we need to stop thinking of immigrants just in economic terms. Mm -hmm. It's very dehumanizing. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean I think immigrants deserve to be here, period. Mm -hmm. Not immigrants deserve to be here because they do the jobs that nobody else wants to do. You see what I mean? You know, or that immigrants are good because you know they bring this much spending power and that they contribute this much to our economy or that or because they pay this much in taxes no immigrants are here because of other more important reasons mm -hmm. <laughs> not just what they bring to the economy so so i think that you know it may seem little but i think it's a fundamental shift in the way that we think about immigrants that can make a big difference all right. <laughs> um, this just, podcast is very serious all yeah. of a sudden. Yeah. Um, UAA, though, I, I do want to say, because this is a UAA podcast. <laughs> you know, UAA, like I said, it, you know, it's it, I owe a lot to UAA, not just, you know, as a student, but even as a professor now for the past 15 years. Um, I really am very thankful to this place. I, I just hope uh, that uh, um, and that we continue to serve you know, the next generations of Alaskans and next generations of students um, to make the world, you know, better for all people. Whatever direction UAA takes, I hope it's the direction of not just educating or training individuals to get a job and become rich. I hope UAA is just as much into educating and training people to be good people. EJ, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you.
Sea Wolf Voices is a production of the University of Alaska Anchorage Office of Advancement and Alumni Relations. Thank you.